Okay, here we go. Lecture one in BioSci 101. Um, we're going to talk about imaging modalities. In other words, different types of imaging. Also, imaging techniques. All of all modalities, techniques, uh, methods, types. All of those are kind of the same word in this case. So you've seen the logo for the Merit Microscopy program, and here we go. These are some really useful uh, websites where you can find more info. And these are also great. We're going to be looking at some of these soon. So let's start with why use a microscope? Why do microscopes even exist, let alone, you know, why are they so great? And I'm going to start first by telling you what they are not. Because <laughs> I think there's far too many people who consider them magnifying glasses. And they think that what a microscope does is it's just a fancy version of a magnifying glass. And the more magnification, the better. That's the power of a microscope. That's not true. A microscope isn't about just making things that you can already see a little bit better. Here's an example. I want you to remember this, and when you do it in lab in a few weeks, to um, you know observe this for yourself. Because as a true scientist, remember, we're always skeptics. We don't believe things anybody <laughs> tells us. Um, we barely believe ourselves. We're always checking for evidence and proof. Okay, so here's the deal. If you have a glass slide and you put some unstained cheek cells on it and you put a cover slip on it, you aren't going to be able to tell there's anything there because they are transparent. You're, the fluid from your mouth, your saliva is transparent. It's going to look like there's nothing under that cover slip. And if you magnify nothing, you just get a bigger version of nothing, <laughs> okay? So bigger version of nothing is still nothing to see except transparent glass and transparent saliva. And presumably there's cheek cells in there, but you wouldn't know with your own eyes. You need a microscope to see things those cells. They were there, they are there, and it's the microscope that allows you to see them. So a microscope allows you to see reality, to see what is actually there, but our, our own eyes can't see it. So we like to say that it makes the invisible visible. It's invisible to us, but it exists. And so using a microscope, we can see what is there and what we otherwise would not realize is there. So that's the power of a microscope. It's letting us see so much more of reality than we could otherwise see. I think in English people say things like, oh, I'm going to put you under a microscope, meaning I'm going to examine you carefully and thoroughly. Yeah, I don't mind that, because um, of course as scientists we are careful and thorough, but Really, being under a microscope <laughs> is more about revealing truth that cannot otherwise be seen by any other means. And yes, mostly in small things. So we're talking about things that are too small for our own eyes to see or too transparent to see. So again, it's not about magnification. That It happens to also magnify things. But it doesn't magnify nothing. It magnifies reality. And reality that we can't otherwise see. But we can because using a microscope gives us contrast and resolution. So why use a microscope? We don't use it for its magnifying power. We use it to gain contrast and to gain resolution. These are the two key pillars of microscopy, contrast and resolution. So they are your new best friends forevermore from this day onwards. They were always your best friends. You just didn't acknowledge them, and now you'll have proper gratitude. So what I mean by contrast, contrast, where you're so transparent, um, 
Contrast is the opposite, actually, of being transparent. <laughs> is Let's say there is something that's transparent, like your cheek cells. Well, how can we make it not transparent? <laughs> we can color your cheek cells, and in fact, you're going to do this in your home lab. You're going to add a dye called meth uh, methylene blue so that your cheek cells stand out, and they have more contrast in your as opposed to the glass, which you're not going to dye. So you can um, have different colors and therefore have contrast. Or you can also have the same color and just have different levels of intensity of that same color. Or in our case, different levels of intensity of light. Contrast is basically variety. Nature loves variety. Um, nature's all about Evolution is about creating endless variety, right? So nature is about diversity and variety. Everything's good. The point is, let's just be different than from our, you know, in our case, the pixel next to us in the image. So different parts of the sample, the specimen, the image. We want diversity. We want variation in that because that's how we can actually see things. So contrast. Let's look at some examples of contrast. Here's examples of variation in intensity. This is all just different kinds of gray, and um, and yet you can see structures, right? You can see a mountain and a lake and a rock in the lake and so on. Here's some variations in intensity. Um, this is just from an artist that I uh, pulled off of the internet. and you can see that maybe there's um, less shades of gray in this image. Um, we're heading towards talking about that a lot in the um, in a future lecture because it's very important to microscopist how many gray levels there are. Just a big hint there. So you know we can see a uh, gray that we might call black. <laughs> you know, it's so it's so deeply gray. Um, in this color in the center that we assume are trees, in the shape of trees, there's still mountains, there's still sky, there's still a lake. And, you know, again, a beautiful image with a lot of contrast. We would say this is high contrast. This is maybe a little less a low contrast image, but it's still different, you know, levels of gray, different variations in intensity. Here's an example just side by side, low contrast, high contrast. The more contrast you have, the you know more you can see basically so when we when I talk about microscopy as I've said before I kind of focus on biology and biological microscopy even though it's used in material science in all sorts of other fields um, but it's widely used especially in the Bay Area in biology <laughs> so um, when we're talking about imaging biological specimens, we have a huge problem because they are low in contrast. Also, by the way, it started in biology. But anyway, little aside, coming back to the, the uh, huge problem of using a microscope with some biological specimen, most biological specimens, um, that especially the ones that a lot of us are looking at, which are mammalian tissues, things like that. We're trying to cure cancer or so forth. So most biological specimens are low in contrast. They're not, the, the whole tissue is kind of the same color, or the same everything. And we can't tell one part of a cell from another, one part of a tissue from another if we just stick it under the microscope. So how do we create contrast? Well, there's two really important fundamental ways to do this. One you've already heard of and probably you immediately thought about. You use a stain. So you color it. You paint it, basically. And that's a whole world of techniques that I'm summarizing with just one little bullet point. Another entire world of techniques is to use a microscopy technique so your specimen is unstained. It's as is, as it, like the cheek cells that came out of your uh, mouth. They're just transparent. They're not stained. You can still see them if you put them on the right kind of microscope, a microscope that uses wonderful tricks of physics to generate contrast. And so we call those contrast generating microscopy techniques or modalities or, you know, whatever words you want to use there. But these are different types of microscopy and they actually create contrast for you. And two of the most famous kinds that um, 
you will learn about and the most widely used are DIC and phase. So in the case of these contrast generating microscopy techniques, you're getting a black and white image and you're getting contrast from the intensity, just like those pretty pictures of mountains I showed you. And actually that first picture of cheeks, cheek cells I showed you, we're talking about contrast through different levels of intensity. Um, and as you'll learn, it's intensity that is varied because of the light passing through your specimen, basically. Okay, so summarizing this, we need contrast in order to see something. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just a big shade of gray, like all the same shade. In fact, as I'm looking at this, you can see that this, this guy is showing up as very low contrast, right, this image. So contrast can come from variations in intensity like DIC and phase techniques use. And so you have to have a special microscope that is tricked out for DIC or for phase. It has different parts that make it possible to do DIC and phase on those scopes. Or contrast can come from variations in color. And that includes modalities in imaging known as bright field and fluorescence that we're going to talk about a lot about fluorescence because that's our specialty here. So here are some images. This is a bright field image colored with a stain uh, known as H&E, which is the stain of histo and histotex. So um, it's a very important stain that has given us um, an enormous amount of, of knowledge and um, countless lives were saved thanks to Hestotex who use a stain. So that's some human tissue that's actually a little bit, that's a glomerulus of a kidney if you know um, your anatomy and physio already. So here's another image. This is a cheek cell, the second image here, and that is a uh, actually not stained and it was imaged using phase um, imaging modality. The next one over is another cheek cell and this time it was it was DIC that was used and uh, probably the original image was better but by the time it's getting to our screens it's very low contrast. You can see how difficult that is, right? And then this last one is a fluorescence image that I actually took um, I was going to say on our scopes, but this one I actually took when I was in grad school. So here's some different modalities, different ways of imaging um, different specimens. Specimen, by the way, is anything that you just put under the microscope. So <laughs> if it's under the microscope, it's a specimen. Okay, we're going to flip what we just learned and just organize it differently so you can just hear it and hear it again. So microscopy techniques or modalities include DIC and phase, in which you have unstained, thin, transparent, low contrast specimens like your cheek cells. And yet, because of the microscope and because of the physics, those specimens become visible. So you can put something that is not stained, that is naturally transparent, there should be a comma after that, it is naturally low contrast, um, thin, this is new, I'm just telling you it needs to be thin <laughs> if it's, it's going to work. Um, your cheek cells count, they're pretty thin. So unstained, thin, transparent, low contrast specimens become visible using DIC or face. That's why they are called contrast generating techniques. If you put, let's say, your entire finger on the scope as a specimen, it's not going to work. It's going to be too fat for it. So if you're thinking, what's thin, thin enough? Well, that's kind of a central question that we're going to address a lot in this class. What is thin enough? Cheek cells, thin enough. Let's start with that. Other imaging modalities include that you just learned about include bright field and fluorescence. So in this case, we start with a colored specimen. We're adding it through stains or through fluorescence. We're using fluorescence uh, stains, basically fluorescent molecules. And um, therefore, you have color already. Your specimen already comes in with contrast. 
So that is summarizing contrast. Contrast basically comes from either staining it or putting it on a contrast generating scope. What about resolution? What did I mean when I said resolution is what is the point of a microscope? It's the point of buying a half million dollar scope. I kind of, I always get, I think it's funny that people think, well, yeah, I'd pay half a million dollars for a good um, magnifying glass. No, <laughs> that half million dollar scope is doing a lot more stuff than just making things bigger. So, um, one of the key things, in fact, the more expensive the scope, the more it does this. So one of the key things is resolution. One of the key things that a scope does for the world and for you. So what does resolution mean? Here's how we define it. We think about reality and we think about two individual dots and they exist. They are real things in the specimen we're looking at. And it, once we're imaging it, they are real points of light because an image is a series of points of light. So, um, and just to repeat that because it's kind of important, an image in the kind of microscopy we're doing is mostly uh, different points of light. It's a series of points of light. Okay, so let's think about the specimen itself. In the specimen, there are two dots. Just to make the physics, the thinking, everything super simple, let's think about two equal dots that are next to each other. Are we able to see that there are two dots? Or are we going to think that it's just one dot? And you might think, why would we think it's one dot? <laughs> if it's two dots, it's two dots. But that's the point. In we don't always see reality as it is. It's not as easy <laughs> as you might first think or assume. You need resolution to see two dots that are there as two dots. And the better the resolution, the more info you have. So let's do a thought exercise for a moment. We're going to stay on this slide for a minute. Think about... Well, let's use a classroom. <laughs> let's get nostalgic. <laughs> We're hopeful for when we'll be all in a classroom together. You're in a classroom at Merritt, Camp, at Merritt College, you know, on a campus, and there's 30 of us in that classroom. And that classroom is run of many classrooms on Merritt College, on the campus of Merritt College. And there's some intelligent life on Mars, let's just say, that has a special tool that allows them to see what they've defined as, coincidentally, as humans. <laughs> coincidentally and correctly, as humans. And so the Martians are looking down at Merritt College and they're looking at our very classroom. But their microscope is still an early, cheaper microscope. And it sees all of us 30 people, plus me, in that room as one human. Well, that's a lovely philosophy, but we know by our definition that there's 31 of us. And the Martians don't have great resolution. They have enough resolution to tell that, you know, tell us apart from a nearby classroom to tell Merrick College apart from other college campuses or other gatherings of people um, back when there were gatherings or back in the future when there will be gatherings. You know, so that just think about from a bird's eye view or if you prefer um, from some sort of satellite or whatever, but think about these Martians looking at Merrick College, looking at classrooms and going, oh, there's a signal that you know tells me there's humans there if you were them you would want to have more resolution like you're like is it one human or is it more than one human here's the thing if all of you are sitting in your desks and I move away from the desks I go into the hallway maybe they can spot me because I'm far enough away from the bulk of the signal there's enough distance between me and the other uh, signal that distance is called a resolution limit. 
basically, if we're, <laughs> maybe they always thought there were a certain number of humans, but now that we're all six feet apart, they can tell us apart because their resolution limit is six feet apart. Oh my God, is this the Martians doing this to count humans? Okay, that's another topic. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, resolution, <laughs> it depends how close the dots are, whether you can tell them apart or not. So there's this thing called the resolution limit, which is the shortest distance between two spots that allows you to see them as two separate spots. Let's have a picture just to um, illustrate this. If reality is there's two spots or 31 humans or whatever it is, let's say there's two spots, what the scope sees, if it doesn't have good enough resolution, is one spot. And then you can't magnify your image and get better resolution. You're just, you're missing info. You, you can't, you'll just, you magnify, you get a big, bigger spot. But again, that's not the point of it. I don't need a big spot. I need to count humans or spots in my image or anything like that. Um, so magnification doesn't overcome re low resolution. It's other things in your objective, in your specimen prep, in your camera. We're going to go into this throughout the whole semester and then wrap it up at the end of the semester. But there's a variety of components of your scope that contribute to resolution. And um, it's sometimes somewhat simple, sometimes not. But again, the better the scope, the better the resolution. Here's an example of... Uh, you know, here's the same specimen, same magnification, it's just one is a better scope with a better resolving power than the other, and you can just get a lot more info out of it. And just a preview, what are some of the key scope parts that um, give you both contrast and resolution? The objective is really important. Having a good objective is kind of everything. <laughs> almost everything. So an objective will give you good contrast and it will give you good resolution. There's something called the NA or numerical aperture. Just previewing this. This is things where I preview stuff I'm not going to ask you about on the quiz, but since you're going to the AIM conference, you might hear people talking about resolution and um, super resolution, which I'm going to tell you about in a little bit. And uh, things like PSF and ARRI disks, that's all talk about trying to get better resolution out of our scopes because that's really the big drive right now and the exciting part of microscopy innovation that you'll hear about at the AIM conference. So your illumination source actually gives you um, a limit to your resolution. And what illumination sources are there? Well, optical microscopy, which is what we're going to discuss and do, uses light. And there's just a limit to resolution inherent to light until only a few years ago when, <laughs> when uh, we turned physics on its head. Well, I actually used physics to prove that actually we can go beyond that resolution limit, and that's called super resolution. But until for a few hundred years, until just recently, there was a, a sort of hard stop to the resolution than an optical microscope could possibly give you. And then there's electron microscopes, and they use electrons instead of light. And so coming, just summarizing that quickly, again, optical microscopy uses light. The theoretical resolution limit has is 200 nanometers, and it has to do with the wavelength of light and what we call visible light. And that includes all these techniques I've been talking about. So bright field fluorescence, DIC, phase, etc. Electron microscopy uses electrons and has a much smaller theoretical resolution limit of 0.5 nanometers. In other words, for optical microscopy, if two human, well, your two spots are 200 nanometers apart, you can tell them apart, but if they're closer, you can't. And there's a lot of things in our cells that are much closer than that. And we'd like to be able to tell them apart. In that case, we have, we've always had to turn, over, turn to electron microscopy, the, which is a fantastic field. And there's a great training program um, at Delta College in Stockton around this. 
Um, the thing with electron microscopy is that tech, typically it involves a lot of specimen prep and um, it pretty much you can't see things live because you have to operate in a vacuum to use those electrons, which means your biological samples are dead. And in biology, that's a big issue. We often want to observe live samples doing what life is and interacting and responding and so on. There's also a small field of view. But the main thing is it's harder to do, basically, electron microscopy. It's getting easier, but it still um, involves a lot of specimen prep, and um, you still can't see live samples even to this day. Not really. You can see them as you're killing them in RSCM, but that sort of doesn't quite count. Okay, so <laughs> what can you see given these uh, resolution limits? In optical microscopy, you can see tissues, of course. That's what histo does. Cells, which are part of tissues. You can see organelles that are inside of cells if they're fairly big. You can see bacteria. They're about a micron in size quite easily. In electron microscopy, we often use it to get better images of the organelles. And if you need to see a virus of any sort, <laughs> including our nemesis, uh, coronavirus right now, um, you have to use electron microscopy. With the caveat, um, if you fluorescently tag it and make it bright enough, um, you can sometimes see the viruses under optical microscopy too. You're not gonna, you're just gonna see them as a spot of light. Like you can't tell one virus from another, mostly. Um, anyway, really if, like those great pictures of the coronavirus, um, those are all taken on using electron microscopy where it shows you the spikes and so on. And um, yeah, if we want to see very large assemblies of molecules, we need to go down to electron microscopy. So you might notice there's no, been no pictures of viruses swimming in through our nose or anything like that, because they have to be dead for us to image them for the most part, except for maybe in a few really fancy labs, I'm sure are working on that. But generally speaking, to see a virus, you got to use an electron microscope. Bacteria, you can see live bacteria just fine, swimming around, moving, if they're the kind of bacteria to move on your regular light microscope. The resolution limits, um, oops, sorry, there we go. Your, your eyes, see, can tell things apart if they're about 100 microns apart. A micron, I think your hair is about maybe a few microns or something, just to give you a sense. Um, optical microscopes, like we said, things have to be 200 nanometers apart. In electron microscopes, I said half a nanometer, now I'm saying one nanometer, because, oh, it just depends on the kind of on the deep physics arguments and the kind of scope. But in that ballpark, um, it's obviously got better resolution than an optical microscope. And sizes. A cell, your average typical cell is about, we just generally rule of thumb, so to speak, 10 microns. There's wide variation in cells too, but um, this is your, um, if you remember your intro bio, eukaryotic cells, so a cell with a nucleus, like our own cells, basically. Bacteria, rule of thumb, you, you can say they're about a micron. So you can see, you know, we can see things inside of bacteria because they're bigger than our resolution limit. We can tell parts of the bacteria from other parts. And the virus is usually, even the big fat coronavirus, <laughs> way smaller than a bacteria. Um, so this is just a general rule of thumb to kind of orient yourself. If you haven't seen this video, it's from the 70s. You can tell from the clothes. It's by some designers, not, not microscopists at all. Um, but it's such a great classic. It get, It's powers of 10 and some of, at the... When they go into the cell, that's just drawings at that time anyway. Um, but it gives you a sense of how big and small things are because for thinking about microscopy, it's really good for your brain to sort of have some 
categories in there of what is really, really tiny and really and just tiny and just small and versus, you know, I can see it with my own eyes, etc. There's a little interactive on um, sizes that students have found useful here. And, um, oh, this is me pointing out some terminology that I've been using, um, because as you go into ch check other sources, microscopy will get confusing. Microscopy is a bunch of anarchists, as I said in my intro video, all of whom know what they're doing. Well, the real microscopists, they know what they're doing, but everybody just calls things by a different name and argues endlessly over them because we're scientists and we find it fun. So some of the terminology is not settled. It's not, we're not chemists. We don't get organized and have conferences and decide on terminology. Um, for instance, when I said there's optical microscopy and electron microscopy, some, there's two types of electron microscopy. And some of the, some people think SCM versus is one of those types is actually an optical um, field for various technical issues. I clearly don't. I'm giving you my categories that are shared, however, by a wide number of microscopists. So why, why am I telling you this? Because be ready <laughs> for the rest of the semester. There will be multiple occasions where I say nobody can agree on the terminology because a lot of microscopy, I think, has been about pointing to things and saying that that part of the scope, there's no name for it. There's just, you know, point. Because um, remember, microscopy hasn't been taught in an organized fashion. It's just taught one person to another. So when I said bright field microscopy, people, different people use it differently. And what you will find is the best I can do is say bright field microscopy includes phase microscopy, DIC, and then what people just say bright field microscopy. In other words, it's light. It's transmitted light, which just means the light is going through the specimen. And if you ask somebody, they'll say DIC is a type of bright field microscopy or phase is a type of bright field micro microscopy. Remember, these are the two contrast generating techniques. But then there's just plain old <laughs> bright field microscopy, which is on these same scopes and doesn't involve the parts that you need for phase or DIC. And people will just say that's bright field microscopy too. <laughs> So bright field microscopy is its own subset of bright field microscopy is the best I can give you. So basically when somebody says bright field microscopy, most of the time they're just talking about your straight up regular um, standard scope without anything, any fancy modifications for fluorescence, phase, DIC or anything like that. And they'll just say bright field microscopy. And if it does have modifications, they will name the modification and say this was phase microscopy but technically phase microscopy is part of the larger category of <coughs> bright field microscopy so don't worry too much about um you know i'm not going to ever ask you trick questions don't worry too much about sort of the details of this i'm just letting you know that there's sloppiness and um diversity and how people approach the same words that's that's all that's why i'm telling you here this is a cute little graphic that i like um, that shows you oh look here's um different things that we could that exist in the world you know different from big to smaller in terms of size and then here are what we can see with our eye we can obviously tell look at a tree and tell one tree from another or human oh look here's a human here's another here's a human next to a tree our eyes can see that can you look at that human and see the bacteria on the human or the bacteria on the tree no even though they're there you need a light microscope for that <laughs> and if you want to see the viruses on that on the bacteria, on the tree, on the human, then you probably need an electron microscope for that. And the last thing you you just can't see, not really, with a microscope. And if you've been kind of going, why is she talking about microns? What's a micron? <laughs> Here's a really handy chart with more info than you need, but I like it because it organizes 
everything in terms of you know how small is a nanometer compared to a micrometer which is a micron compared to a millimeter compared to a meter and by the way where are the foot feet and pounds and quarts and libs I don't know. American stuff no that is uh, in science <laughs> this is my Italian side coming out in science thank heavens we go by the metric system because it's so simple everything's in powers of 10 everything is um, smaller or larger by 10 or 100 times or something like that so everything's a tenth of something or a hundredth of something okay so if you're starting with a meter which is about you're about a meter and some in height then you know a millimeter is a thousandth of a meter <laughs> so you have probably we have a thousand 500 meter, uh, millimeters on you, probably. And a micrometer is a millionth of uh, how tall half of you, basically. Okay, so let's now look more carefully at different imaging techniques. And we start this class with this topic because this program was founded with the assistance of a focus group. Of, and the focus group was people in the industry, potential employers. And we said, <laughs> what do you need our students to know for you to hire them? And they said two things. They said, one, they need to know how to focus the scope. And we were all like, really? <laughs> you have people who don't know how to focus the scope. And I've seen that. That's very true since. Two, they said they need to understand what almost no one in the field, well, who's not deeply in the field, understands that not every microscope is the answer to your to every question. And there's a tool, a different tool for every need. And it's really important to understand that there's different microscopes that do different things. And just because the confocal is the most expensive microscope in the room, the it doesn't mean the other microscopes aren't the one that you actually need. You need to match your specimen to your microscope to your question. Okay, so we start with, right away, instead of telling you about my favorite technique and the one that's going to get you the most jobs, um, we're going to talk about all the different techniques out there so that you are an informed microscopist and you can say, well, this specimen really should be looked at in the following way. Okay, so bright field. Bright field microscopy, bright field imaging modality, bright field technique. It uses transmitted light. That means that the light shines through the specimen. Therefore, the specimen has to be pretty thin. And... Um, Let's just skip this part on amplitude objects. It's in your Murphy book, but no one says it anymore. So I apologize. I need to take this out. But basically, your specimen needs to have contrast is what that means. And so it's either naturally there or because you've stained it. And um, if you're in histology or histotechnician or path, the related, um, then you're going to stain it with H&E, which we're going to see soon. If you're in botany, the nice thing is plants are actually the exception to the rule in biology. They are nicely colorful, <laughs> and so you don't have to do much to see them. They're just beautiful for uh, specimens. So um, here's some skin stained with H&E, this pink, purple, these tones. Um, if you've taken anatomy, you've seen them already. Um, this is... This is what histotechs do, is they do the magic of taking a tissue and turning it into some a beautiful thin section that's stained that we can use just regular light, um, bright field light, to see amazing, amazing information about the human body. And here's a plant tissue that um, probably is stained actually but it could also not be stained with plants you never know because they're pretty colorful too so here's a pine needle here's some more bright field again thyroid gland again h and e stain again made by a histotech here's pine needle again 
So just examples of Brightfield, you really want to start training your eye towards, oh, what's Brightfield, what's not? Um, here's Peter, oh, Peter used to be faculty, and then he went to Galway to get his master's in microscopy. So I've um, put, for images that were, if there's a name, <laughs> it means one of our students took an image, and um, as much as possible, I've put you know where where their career has led them to date. Um, so again, this is uh, Brightfield. This is a neuron. Harris is now actually he was working for Zeiss, but now he's at the Buck Institute of Aging in Marin County. Um, Brightfield again. Oh, <laughs> I love Harris's aunt. So Brightfield again. Okay, face. What about face? Phase also uses transmitted light, and the specimens are called phase objects, and they can be unstained. And um, really, a lot of things are, how do we know they're phase objects? We put them under the phase scope. Oh, look, I see something. Okay, they're phase objects. How do we know it's phase instead of bright field? There's these little halos um, that are typically visible, and I'll show you in the next slide. But honestly, sometimes we've developed new types of phase that wipe out those halos because they're kind of annoying. <laughs> and so it's not a dead giveaway. But if you, well, it's a dead giveaway if you see the halo. If you don't see the halo, it could be phase, could be bright field, hard to know. And we, you'll encounter phase scopes in cell culture. So biotech, the entire industry, is based on the fact that we can grow cells without, just in incubators, without a body, without the animal attached to it. And we can get those cells to make, express things like drugs. And um, like insulin was the first um, product of the biotech industry. So cell culture that you're going to learn about this semester is one of the most important tools in terms of job skills and also it's really doing fundamentally uh, important things for the world. Okay, so you see phase scopes all over the place in TC labs because they're it's pretty inexpensive. They're among the cheapest um, tricked out scopes, if you will, and it's simple to use. You don't have to do anything other than just put your dish of cells, and then you can look at this. These are your Cho cells, the ones that are grown by the biotech industry. And you can see the phase halo, um, especially around little small round things and edges and things like that. Then we come to DIC. DIC is also known as Nomarski after the person who invented it or popularized it. It also uses transmitted light, so the light goes through the specimen, gets altered by the specimen, and gives you this cool image. And you can have unstained um, uh, specimens. You don't have to stain them. You just stick them on the DIC scope and you can see things. And it has this lovely 3D appearance to it, but it's not real 3D. I'm going to show you on the slide right away so you don't get tricked by it. Um, there may or may not be color. I mean, the specimen may or may not be stained or have its own color. Uh, but So just because there's color doesn't mean it's DIC. What you want to look for in recognizing DIC is this sort of embossed look, this 3D-ish look. And it's... Um, widely used in biology. Cell biologists like myself just love it. It adds another uh, ten dollars to $30,000 to your scope, and your scope was already $20,000, you know, so it's expensive. Well, your, your, your face scope was $20,000. You're usually doing DIC with fluorescence, which means your scope was $30,000, and then it adds, you know, $30,000 to a million dollars, depending. And then it adds another 20000 or so, so it's expensive. And here are some beautiful cheek cells. And you can see that the nucleus looks like it's popping out, like kind of like the cheek cells are super flat and the nucleus is just super, just popping out of it. That's not reality. That's just telling you that it's denser than the surrounding cells. So this is a density map is what DIC is. Um, and we'll talk about this more later on. I'm just doing a brief flyby intro to the different kinds of techniques so that you can start looking at images and developing your eye and developing your ability to tell what's what. 
when it's possible. So here's this same, this is a nice side by side comparison of the same specimen um, in DIC versus in phase. You'll notice I'm getting a lot of these from uh, those links that I gave you in the beginning. Um, there's a lot of great teaching material online. Okay, now another technique polarized light. It also uses. <coughs> Excuse me. It also uses transmitted light, and we say that the specimen mu must be anisotropic or birefringent. Don't worry about those words right now. But the point is that not all specimens <laughs> show us anything uh, work in polarized light. So the internal structure of the the material has to have actually a direction to it and a imbalanced direction to it for for it to, for polite uh, microscopy to work. So for instance, cells don't work, you don't see anything under a polite scope unless they're dividing, but materials, um, they, materials like I'm gonna show you in a second are crystals, oh, they look so beautiful. Okay, so there's this um, typical bright multicolored appearance and it's widely used in geology because rocks look great and the colors have information to them. And pole light scopes are actually quite ex inexpensive. You can kind of create your own, and some people have, <laughs> using even our Medjis just by putting a little pole sheet. And, like, <laughs> you take a cheap set, really cheap set of sunglasses, and you, you know, break it in two and sort of put one, those are polarized lenses, just put them at different parts of the scope and you're good to go. That's a sort of homemade hack for pole scope. Okay, so again, this is um, from Davidson's website where there's just a beautiful catalog of a lot of gorgeous images. Pole light is everybody's crowd pleaser of an image because, I mean, look at this. This is a hormone that was crystallized and it's extraordinarily beautiful, right? And then there's another, is your endorphins looking like a feather and an, pr parts of a protein looking like just angel's wings or butterflies. I mean, how much prettier can you get? Well, here's an antibiotic <laughs> competing for best looking molecule uh, of the year or lemon zest. I mean, lemon, no, not zest, lemon flavoring. So you'll see at the website, there's just a lot more of these beautiful images. Okay, kind of last, but certainly not least, is fluorescence. So this is what we're going to focus on because A, it's the coolest, B, <laughs> it's the prettiest, and C, it's actually going to get you the jobs you need, that you're looking for. So fluorescence uses what's known as incident light. In other words, it's light... <laughs> It doesn't go, the light doesn't go through the specimen. It actually bounces off of it. it and we're going to go into this next week. So um, I'll explain further then. Fluorescence is also known as epifluorescence. I, I give you this catalog of traits about each um, type of modality for you to also look back at later in the semester and come back to these slides and go, oh, now I understand everything deeply, as opposed to now I'm just introducing you to the concept, okay? So the specimens need to, so fluorescence means that you're emitting light. So the specimens are emitting light. I think it's so cool. You look in the ocular, you shine let's say, blue light at your specimen, and it sh it absorbs that light, and then it creates, in response to the blue light you gave it, it creates green light as a signal, and it shines back out at you. So the coolest thing is when you look through your fluorescent scope, and your slide is totally transparent, you can't see anything on it, you shine some blue light, and then you get this beautiful green coming back, and then you shine green light at it, and you get this beautiful red coming back, and it's just amazing. These are bright neon colors. It is what, here, let's just go to a picture for heaven's sakes. It is what you see. This is what you see in the objective. This is not photoshopped. Well, it's actually a little bit photoshopped <laughs> to give it more contrast. 
Um, this is actually your instructor, and I took it together uh, when he was selling me the Nikon scopes that I took it on. It was a demo. It was one of the reasons I was like, I have to buy these scopes. Look how pretty. This is a cell. The blue is the DNA in the cell in the nucleus. The red is the mitochondria. For those of you who know what that is, um, they're the parts of the cell that um, give you energy, make ATP. They're also really important and aging and things like that. And then the green are, is actin, which is the protein. When you eat meat, you're eating actin because actin is basically, there's a lot of it in um, muscle cells, but in all, it's also present in every cell because it gives the cell a structure and it's this thing called a cytoskeleton. Anyway, gorgeous, right? Not just gorgeous, but the cool thing about fluorescence is oh my gosh, we can label different parts of a cell using fluorescence, and therefore we can study and look at just the mitochondria and nothing else. Oh wait, I just want to see the nucleus. Okay, I'm going to just look at the blue. Oh wait, I only want to see the actin, those proteins. Okay, I'll just look at the green and see what's going on. Here's a really nice compilation in fluorescence. Um, same information, they just took the color out of different structures. And actually taking the color out allows our eyes to see contrast better. So, you know, here's the stain of the Golgi. Here's a stain of the lysosomes, the lysosomes that, you know, chew up things inside of cells. Um, here's a stain of, again, microtubules, my favorite <laughs> act, and things like that. So these aren't the same cell, but they could be the same cell stained for different parts. This gives us a ton of information. It's how we figure out uh, what disease is affecting what part of the cell and what we can do about it, and so much more. So coming back to fluorescence, some, some cells, some things are actually, they fluoresce on their own. We're gonna do, I'm not gonna tell you quite right now, because. <laughs> I want you to notice as you're searching for images what tends to autofluoresce or not, and we'll return to that. Um, and sometimes our, so you can already tell, our human cells or mammalian cells don't fluoresce. And so we manipulate them. We, we do what's called fixing, permeabilizing, and staining them with antibodies linked to fluorophores. We transfect them with genes that contain GFP and other variants, and we can do live cell dyes. Again, this we're going to go into, this is just a preview right now. We're going to go into great detail about all of these techniques. But the point is, we usually need to do all sorts of fun, relatively easy, but still, you know, something we have to do to prepare our specimens in other so we can see them fluoresce. And we have to think carefully about this. Microscopy is basically a third of the time it's preparing your specimen, a third of the time it's looking at your specimen, and a third of the time it's analyzing your data. Um, so, and I will come back to that later too. But, um, and we get contrast because there's colors. And there's wide field fluorescence, which is um, the kind of the introscopes um, that we're using. And then confocal, which allows us to get better resolution, basically. And yes, it's widely used in biology and scopes start at 30,000. Well, except for we might be trying to make one for um, uh, one for about a thousand. We'll see if that works. <laughs> this is the age of hacking everything, right? So using a 3D printer and some cheap objectives, we'll see if we can do carry that out this semester. It might actually be part of a lab that you do if we're successful. Okay, so there's fluorescence. Here's some more pretty slides. So a neuron and a glial cell, a slide that has two, a cell that has two nuclei, which happens a lot when we grow them in culture. Um, I'll let you check out. There's movies because again, these are these can be in living cells. Um, this is a lab that. Um, basically is able to paint every neuron a different color and therefore see the connections, which is really amazing. Here's something, some images taken by students in our program. Um, 
I feel like I told you about this in a previous video, but this, this student, this is the scent gland. I love this because it's a scent gland in basil and a student was eating her specimen as she was um, preparing it. She still works at uh, Biohub. This is, um, this is a fly. It autofluoresces, and Dominique is now still at Genomic Health, though it's called Exact Sciences now. Is the mouth of the fly really fascinating? Um, uh, Erica's uh, fluorescent kidney image, not her kid, not her own kidney. Chantha's skin, Kenny uh, Moore's skin. Johannes is now a teacher for us in his stuff. <laughs> So and he still works there too, um, at Exact Sciences. Christina uh, took these white little flowers and just put them under the scope and got these amazing images, including this award-winning one. Uh, Peter now works for Zeiss and will probably be a guest speaker. Stella uh, still works at the Buck Center. Sandra still does educational nonprofits, but took this amazing picture of a louse that she found herself. And Toby is getting her PhD. And here's some cool videos I'm going to let you look at. And after all that excitement, <laughs> we're going to end <laughs> with a little bit about electron microscopy. Um, again, we focus on optical microscopy, but it's good you should know about EM. So EM uses uh, photons, uh, I mean, sorry, electrons instead of photons of light. And again, in that vagueness, um, people, technically there's TEM, transmitted electron microscopy, and then there's SCM, which I have on the next slide. But if people, and both of them are types of EM, electron microscopy, if people say EM, they're usually talking about TEM. They just don't bother to specify TEM. And they'll, so typically people will say EM and SCM as the two possibilities. So the specimens are ultra thin. They're nanometers. <laughs> so there's an ultra microtope to, to slice them even tinier than what we slice them in histo. In histo, we're slicing them a few microns fat, well, thin. And then in EM, you have to slice, like do nanometer thin slices and keep track of those and not lose them. And then you have to like stain them and fix them and add gold and all sorts of fancy things. And uh, it's widely used not only in biology, but in quality control. So it's used around in the Bay Area a lot. Um, it's quite expensive and it does require extensive training. So here's some beautiful Golgi. You saw before the fluorescent Golgi are still pretty. Like it's amazing you can see them because they're a tiny part of a cell. Um, in TEM, you, we can see a lot of the structure of it. So the other type of EM is SEM, scanning electron microscopy. And it's a little easier than TM because you don't have to slice those specimens so thin. You can just sort of put them in and what you're doing is a little bit of just sort of looking at the surface of them. And again, it's better resolution than um, just using light. Still used in biology and quality control, still expensive, still requires extensive training, except in the case of the new tabletop SEM revolution. And we have one of those and we're trying to set it up for you because in those you just need, you don't have to, it's a partial vacuum and you don't have to coat your specimen with gold or anything fancy. And you can just stick things in there and uh, image them with not the greatest resolution, but still great enough to get some amazing images. These weren't taken on that RSEM. These are just some classic SEM pictures. I love this one. This is good to think about in the time of dealing with infectious diseases. This is a white blood cell, a type called a macrophage, and it's coming, it's taken in SEM, so it's a nice 3D uh, quality, and it's coming for that bacteria, but it also could be coming for, you know, a virus infected cell or something like that. These are this is part of your immune response system that helps you um, stay alive, basically, and counteract infectious diseases. So here's a picture of a ma macrophage. Note that SEM, the actual image is all black and white, and then anything that's color is just people Photoshop painting it in 
like in this really cute famous image <laughs> by this amazing microscopist of a little weevil emerging from a bean seed. Um, I just He must have taken thousands of images of bean seeds to find the one with the weevil emerging and going, hey, I'm eating the bean. So it's just cute. I say ignore the color because, it, again, it's just colorized, right? Um, so here is a recap of the techniques or imaging modality and what they are best at. This is, by the way, some fluorescent cells that I just turned into a pattern that I imaged. Okay, so bright field, it's used a lot in histology. Phase, it's used in tissue culture with unstained, very thin specimens. DIC, again, unstained, thin specimens. Polite, I, didn't exp I think I mentioned this, mitotic spindles and DNA in terms of biology, but it's also used in geology a lot. White field fluorescence, then specimens, when you want to see different, you want to tell different parts of the cell from others or different cell, you know, one cell from another. Confocal, it's used in fixed thicker specimens and uh, we create what's known as Z-sections. It's kind of like an MRI only for cells where you go, you can, um, go into the specimen and instead of actually physically cutting it like we do with a microtome, we're doing what are called optical sections. We're just looking in and getting a, a series of sections that we reconstruct in 3D. Spinning disc also gives us live Z-sections. Z, Z it's a type of scope we have at this point. I've usually given you a tour. <laughs> so I'm like, if you're wondering, where did spinning disc talk about? We have one. That's why it's really good for live. Uh, it's quicker than a confocal. It's good for live specimens. Multiphoton is kind of, uh, if you will, an evolution of the confocal um, that can look at even thicker specimens. Um, and deconvolution is good for things that are dim, live, and at the limits of resolution. Again, this is a little bit of a chart of what you're going to learn during the semester. So don't worry if, if you're like, what? To some of these things, we're going to dive deeper. And you're going to look back at this at, later on in the semester towards the end and go, oh, OK, now this all makes sense to me. Or if you're hungry for it, look ahead. And um, I throw this in at this point because of the AIM conference, because you're going to hear about this plus super resolution, which I'll tell you about um, next week. So that's it for this week, except for our little humorous slide to end with.